this is Sasha. Uh, she recently took part in like a, in a big event, in a conference that was dedicated to decolonization of imagination in general, together with uh, a great amount of uh, folks and people around this topic. Uh, which what's the most important and most interesting for me, and I hope for you too, uh, that the, uh, the term uh, decolonization is uh, almost non-existent in Russia. So we don't like have this. Uh, so in in, in, the, in the West, the the topic of decolonization is hype and almost uh, like it's the same as I don't know racism and thing. But it, it's but this kind of discussion just uh, we don't think about this in Russia. So this uh, we'll start to, uh, to talk about Russian context from this talk. And Sasha will elaborate more uh, on on why uh, it's not an issue in Russia. It, it is an issue, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but why, 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 why don't we think about this yet? It's an issue. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Like it's it's a really interesting, um, yeah, situation. So uh, Sasha will. Uh, Introduce yourself uh, more. And let's yeah. uh, and so, so we'll have like about the format. We'll have around 30-40 minutes of uh, like a monologue, yeah. more or less. But you can uh, also take part in it. And after that, we'll start just like, a small discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I really love discussions more than like talking head person. And um, yeah, I'll give a bit more about the context of the lecture, why I was doing that, and. Um, yeah, so basically, originally I was doing that lecture as a part of like decolonizing imagination research, like thing. It's not really a conference. And uh, the main aim of my talk, why I'm putting the big sign decolonization is not a metaphor, because I hated the name decoloniz decolonizing imagination. I think it's basically stupid and ignorant to use the word decolonization in such a manner. And I see that a lot in the West as well, because post-colonial studies used to be hyped uh, like 10 years ago. Now it's considered to be, uh, we've written all of our books about that already. Why should we d discuss that? So it moved slowly to the artsy, fancy discourse of let's decolonize everything. And uh, I consider decolonizing imagination as a really not nice sign of that thing started to happen in Russia, which obviously I hated. So my talk was originally an intervention in that context. So I'm just giving you a brief introduction of how you should interact with my lecture. Please feel free to make any questions, interventions. I really love uh, this paradigm much more because I don't know background of each of you and I don't know how much acquainted you are with original postcolonial studies and to which extent uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about is obvious or maybe too complicated, vague, broad and doesn't make any sense. So about the lecture in particular, I'm going to do a small brief about difference between post-colonial and decolonial approaches. Then I'll stake the main problems I'm trying to avoid in my own research, because I'm obviously researching this topic, and I think are quite widespread in academia in general, and post-colonial and decolonial approaches in particular. And in the end, I'll outline the place post-Soviet space is occupying in colonial relations according to Chernyatsky and Lastanova. And uh, in the end, after the fancy theory, I'm going to introduce the case study. And uh, I would love to decide with you on the case study uh, we're going to elaborate together. Because originally, the case study I was introducing was based on the video I took a steal from. Uh, it's a music clip made by Short Paris, and um, okay, we'll we'll discuss it later after the lecture because I would love to set the main theoretical background. So, um, in order to explain what my research is about, what this lecture is going to be about, I'll start with a trivial example of autoethnography. Because uh, for me, this is one of the easiest ways to avoid too abstract positioning when situating myself in the field as a researcher. So I assume bo like most of you are acquainted with the like situated knowledge by Haraway. So decolonial and postcolonial studies have their own version of situated knowledge. 
and uh, it's formulated as a position to the zero point epistemology and uh, to frame what actually zero point epistemology is meaning, I would say that uh, with the words of Mignola and Lastanova, one of the biggest figures in the colonial approach, so the, the uh, zero point is the limit in which there is an, an observer that cannot be observed. So basically, researcher is such a position where you know everything, you're kind of like positivist, like nice person that has the access to the actual knowledge, but you as a researcher cannot be seen from your own research. And uh, Lassanova elaborates on that more, saying that practicing zero point epistemology legitimizes European languages and thought systems simultaneously disqualify, disqualifying all others. Uh, so as an opposition to zero point epistemology, uh, she puts the pluritopic hermeneutics. It doesn't have to be framed uh, this uh, complex, and uh, I would say that uh, to deconstruct the term I'm using, um, uh, it questions the homogene uh, homogeneity uh, of the understanding subject, so understanding subject is not something universal and true for, for all of the contexts, and, the, uh, and also it questions uh, the very process of construction of the space under cognition with its social and human interests in histories. So basically, the colonial approach is trying to question, OK, why are we talking about West all the time? And why all the subjects we are studying is somehow concerned with the Western context? So um, as a result of the pluritor pluritopic hermeneutics, sorry, I'm, I'm going to struggle a bit with the English through the lecture. So uh, as a result of using pluritopic hermeneutics, um, um, the colonial approach try, is trying to produce various knowledges that will come into di dialogue and what um, knowledge is as such and what kind of knowledge is necessary to make the world a better place for everyone. So as you can guess from this quotation from Tlastanova, the colonial approach is a really militant way of uh, knowledge production that is highly deconstructive in the manner that is constantly questions the whole Western epistemology and the Western way of knowledge production. So uh, this big introduction was made to introduce my own ethno uh, autoethnography that I was talking about. So indeed, there is one particular case I would love to bring to the conversation. In my bachelor's uh, in cultural studies here in Moscow, one of the classes was, was devoted to the topic of globalization. Um, professor told us, in contemporary world, we can see the process of reverse globalization. People from Hawaii colonizing white people with the pattern of their t-shirts which became popular in the West. I find this case representative for several reasons. To begin with, as you can guess from the term my dearest professor invented, he was not acquainted with any of the postcolonial or decolonial critique. For him, there was no such thing as appropriation due to the emblematic deliberate ignorance towards the contemporary power relations and colonial history. This is not a mere coincidence caused by the poor choice of the staff of the faculty management. Postcolonial framework is predominantly ignored in Russian academia. Furthermore, till recently, Western scholars building their careers analyzing Russian culture were getting away without it as well. Not to say that the situation is completely resolved today. Publishing the rare example of the earliest attempt, attempts, 1992 of Ukrainian Australian scholar to start the conversation was ignored or ridiculed by the overwhelm overwhelming majority of <coughs> researchers both from Russia and the West. Chernyatsky is elaborating uh, on, that, on that much more. As Chernyatsky states further, throughout the 1990s, postcolonialism was perhaps the only major contemporary theoretical discourse persistently ignored by Russian academics. As recently as 1998, for instance, a Russian survey of the, uh, of the Western discourse on postmodernism labeled Edward Said as well-known literally scholar of, of a leftist anarchist orientation and Gayatri Spivak as a socially engaged feminist deconstructionist. Uh, so you can see how bad the situation is. Um, but to say that my professor was just lacking uh, the proficiency in postcolonial studies, even because of the white innocence, as framed brilliantly by Gloria Wecker in her book, would be a mistake. 
It comes for me with no surprise that the case we were discussing had nothing to do with the Russian context and or with the context of its ex-colonies. To be precise, during the class, none of the parts of post-Soviet space was mentioned even once. This is a symptom of the typical import of the high Western theory knowledge that manifests itself in much more absurd examples as well, like an exhibition that was devoted to post-colonial issue only because it was fashionable in the West. You can see it on the slide. It was uh, quite a big exhibition in Garage Museum that I hated to my deepest, mm. okay. <laughs> Devoted the whole paper on that. Uh, or, for example, the Russian intersectional feminism, of course I'm part of the movement, so can legitimately criticize it. Um, uh, intersectional feminism, yeah. So myself as Russian intersectional feminism, I really hate the a really deep preoccupation of the feminist movement with the Western context. So we have quite a lot of theory about how racism work, works in US, but there is complete innocence in terms of Russian own position in the colonial relations. So there is a lot of materials, for example, about cultural appropriation connected to the, like, can we wear dreadlocks as white people? completely just like translations of the Western texts, whereas Russian space is somehow absent, absent in the discourse. So um, I'm going to refer to Tlastanova because she's brilliantly framing that. According to the West, um, according uh, to the Western hegemony, it had the privilege of formulating high theory while the rest had to apply it or limit themselves by just a description of their group and personal experience, which would be later properly analyzed by the Western colleagues. So we have the situation when the Western academia has the monopoly on producing knowledge, which we need to apply to our local context in the best case scenario, and then Western academia will tell us if we are doing that right or not. It attempts to take, I'm continuing to quote it, it attempts to take an intermediary border position between Western universalism, Western anti-universalism of a postmodern kind, and the local universalism of a pro-Western or traditionalist orientation. So Western universalism, enlightenment, we're doing the exact science, we know everything, then postmodernism comes and we're saying, oh yeah, actually, everything is relational, um, we are like completely anti-universalists, we are postmodernism, but still somehow Western. And then we have the local universalism. Uh, and this, uh, what Lasanova labels as local universalism of a pro-Western or traditionalist orientation is something as more uh, basically framed as post-colonial studies. So, um, um, this is the point I'm, I'm going to delimit between the post-colonial approach and decolonial approach because decolonial turn, continue to quote Tlastanava, is different from both postmodernity and postcoloniality, as it radically questions the essence, logic, and methodology of the existing system of knowledge and disciplinary spheres. Uh, so, nevertheless, adding two plus two, postcolonial theory and post-Soviet space is not obviously enough the same way that it was not only proficiency that my professor was lacking. As Lastanova in another her article framed, one, ha one can hybridize Lacan with an Indian colonial history and subjectivity and create rich and polysemantic concepts in the vine of Homi Baba, but this is not what the decolonial option is after. We attempt to start not from Lacan, but, but, but from Gloria and Zaluda, or from the Zapatistas, from Caucasus uh, cosmology, or, for, or from Sufism. Postcolonial studies would not formulate their task like uh, would not formulate their task like this because they remain studies. That is, they are co uh, confined with the, within the frame of the modern division into subject who is studying and object which is being studied, and often take research to application on, of Western high theory to local material. So uh, I'm framing that like adding two plus two is not enough. But this vague notion of not enough opens a space rich of possibilities and pitfalls. Therefore, I would love to strategically map the potential traps that I would love to avoid in my own paper and I think would be lovely to avoid uh, in the application of decolonial approach in Russia in general, not only with the aim of escaping them myself in the, per uh, in the first place, but also to ease the process of the criticism both for myself and for the theorists that are working in the field. So first, 
I attempt not to stake out a disciplinary authority, as Chernyevsky frames it, the strategic appropriation of some elements of the discourse on postcolonialism by Russian academics. Even though I'm using postcolonial studies critically and therefore could, accuse, uh, could be accused of stra strategic appropriation, I'll try to restrict myself in the production of the scientific jargonisms necessary only for the establishment of authority mentioned above. Second, I'll avoid referencing scholars romanticizing Soviet Russian colonial past with the aim of taking to the end the perpetuation of the myth, myth of Russia as a self-colonizing state and historical Soviet nostalgia. I'm referring here to the heritage of Atkin and other researchers with, with the similar positions that were exhaustively criticized before me in several uh, papers by Chernyatsky and Zhuk. Using their theoretical framework makes the decolonization of Russia logically impossible. Third, I'll try to escape the usage of political theory as one that has the monopoly on the providing guidance in political life, as framed by, what? I'm, ah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I freaked out. <laughs> uh, third, I'll try, I'll try to escape the usage of political theory as one that has on the providing guidance in political life, as framed by Chakrabarty. Um, I use the Chakrabarty's warning against the left's romance of truth as uh, being exposed to a rational elaboration of the state of the world, it was assumed, would help people to act rationally. I therefore acknowledge that there is no political conversation any longer possible between the professorate and the masses that can happen only on the terms of academics. Um, mm -hmm. Um, it was assumed widely that um, speaking to the audience outside of the university, it, um, audience would listen and would be interested in such a conversation. Furthermore, uh, it creates this particular approach creates the dichotomy between political activists and academics, creating a hierarchy of academics as if they were uh, able to tell political activists what exactly they need to do, which is somehow nonsense. Furthermore, and by criticizing this particular approach, Chakrabarty ma makes uh, a really nice stance that it is really important to to for political science today to acknowledge the murkiness, murkiness of the political today, that we will configure uh, a now so plural as not to be exhausted by any single definition. Uh, it frames um, the really important theoretical uh, background for the criticism of Tlastanova work. And as you can probably guess uh, uh, from the beginning of my talk, and I'm basing a lot of my research on Tlastanova work, so for me it's important to frame the critical stance towards the work Tlastanova is doing, not to per perpetuate her own mistakes. So uh, as Chernyatsky criticized Tlastanova, she's... Um, <laughs> enormously privileging uh, the position of a post-colonial hybrid intellectual. Uh, so basically, she's uh, criticizing nat uh, local nationalist discourse, valid, but the problem is that uh, as soon as um, she's uh, privileging the academic who supposedly knows everything, she's not given any space for uh, political resistance. And in her own res research, uh, the only way she is mentioning political activists and as uh, someone who is uh, using their uh, otherness for their favor. For me, it's somehow a really blurry and not a gay metaphor. So, um, yeah, after talking about political activism, uh, fourth, I move into the main part of my preamble. Uh, I'll struggle against, and I uh, assume that you would love to struggle, against the decolonization as a metaphor. This is the term, uh, the phrase that was introduced by Tuk and Yang in the paper that is named uh, Decolonization is not a metaphor. And based on this paper, I'm going to make three points that are somehow distinctive from one another, but still connected to each other. So to begin with, um, colonialism is not a universal empty signifier. So there is no point of discussing abstractly what colonialism is. This conversation should be localized. And it's obvious for all of the parts of contemporary science, of course, so like if you if you're acquainted with the work of Anat Singh and more 
there is all of the people in the academia who are considered to be fancy are talking about globalization as producing localities and why decolonial theory and post-colonial theory should be uh, somehow an exception. Uh, furthermore, uh, to um, talk a bit in depth about colonialism as not an empty signifier, I'll introduce two distinctions about colonialism. So in post-colonial studies and decolonial approach as well, there is a distinction between external colonialism and internal colonialism. And by external colonialism, it's uh, usually meant uh, the military colonialism, as Tuck and Young frames the creation of war fronts, frontiers against enemies, enemies to be conquered, and the enlistment of foreign land, resources, and people into military operations. Whereas the internal colonialism is theorized as the biopolitical and geopolitical management of people, land, flora, and fauna within the domestic borders of the imperial nation. Uh, but of course, and as Stuck and Young continues, um, it's important uh, to begin with to frame decolonization as something that will take a different shape in each of the, uh, in each of the contexts we are theorizing, and furthermore, that neither external nor internal colonialism adequately describe the form of colonialism which operates in any state that is uh, using settler colonialism. Uh, settler colonialism operates through internal external colonial modes simultaneously because there is no spatial separation between metropole and colony, which is somehow the. Uh, did I move it? No? Okay. Um, yes. Sorry. Um, so uh, it's really important to take in mind that uh, even though it's useful to use both of the contexts, it's not um, it's not productive to limit yourself to them, and it's really important to question them all the time. Um, furthermore, um, if we question the internal and external colonialism, we will uh, end up with the conclusion that. Colonialism is a structure and cannot be reduced to, the, to an event. So um, then Tuck and Young frames, gives a really nice theoretical framework. Uh, as they put it, uh, settler moves to innocence. And um, uh, I would just quote Tuck and Young. So settler moves to innocence are those stra strategies or positionings that attempt to relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility without giving up land or power or privilege, without having to change much at all. In fact, settler scholars may gain professional kudos or a boost in their reputations for, be, for being so sensitive or self-aware, yet settler moves to innocence are hollow that only serve the settler. Uh, the settler, um, and also uh, they're theorizing uh, a figure of settler intellectual who is doing these moves of innocent moves to innocence. So the settler intellectual is the person who is hybridizes decolonial thought with Western critical traditions. Uh, um, the process that is named metaphorizing decolonization, and um, emerges superior to both native intellectuals and cont continental theorists simultaneously. One person I am having in mind for those of you who are really acquainted with the Western Academy is T.G. Demas, the person who is switching from one fancy topic to another fancy topic, and that can be criticized as the person who wrote Decolonizing Nature, whereas staying completely hollow, not producing any alternative, or not even daring to produce any alternative, because the only thing that he dares to use is uh, to be trendy in the academia. I mean, it's fine to do your career, but it's not fine to appropriate the decolonization uh, discourse. So, and uh, here I'm coming to the third point that is somehow framed by T.G. Damas. So, uh, as Fanon, the big father <laughs> we're, we're having in decolonial theory in our lives, um, said decolonization never takes place unnoticed. So uh, decoloniza if you haven't noticed any decolonization happening after the nice conference you've attended, maybe the conference was not actually decolonizing and maybe it aimed just of providing much 
more nicer like CV quotes for the people who were participating in it and not actually like decolonizing. So Tuk and Yang are talking about that a lot as they frame the easy adoption of decolonizing discourse by educational advocacy and scholarship evidenced by the increasing number of calls to decolonize our schools or to uh, or use decolonizing methods or decolonize student thinking turns decolonization into a metaphor. Decolonization, which we assert is a distinct project from other civil and human rights based social justice project, is, projects, is far too often subsumed into the directives of these projects with no regard for how decolonization wants something different than those forms of justice. Uh, they frame these uh, metaphorized and decolonization as one of the forms of cultural appropriation. So basically, if you're like dressing up as a like Navajo, Navajo person or like native person, of course, uh, it's, it's not appropriate. But if you're using decolonization as just a nice metaphor, it's not appropriate as well by the same terms. So um, decolonize a word and decolonization, a noun, cannot easily be grafted onto pre-existing discourses frameworks, even if they're critical, if they, even if they're anti-racist, even if they're justice frameworks. We cannot turn decolonization into an empty signifier to be filled by any track towards liberation. So we cannot just say that like, all of us are colonized and all of us need to struggle against colonization because uh, it uh, draws to the conclusion that as all of us are colonized, none of us are colonizers, which is somehow a problematic stance. So um, I would love here to uh, yeah, go further. And uh, here I'm switching more to the context we're sitting in right now, to the context of Russia. And it's not a surprise that there is something really vague and not like an obscure, which is second world. And um, this is some, something um, the upper derive frames as endless preoccupation of the West with itself whether positive or negative value judgments. So uh, basically what situation we have now in the really basic terms, West is really obsessed with itself, was always and will probably be. And uh, it's not like West cannot uh, accept that there is somehow a conversation happening that is not connected to it at all. So even uh, with the sense of reflection we have now in the West about the coloniality, it's still a big issue to just abandon first world and third world di dichotomy to, to introduce the second world. We are now sitting with you all together. And, um, it's something that can be evident in post-colonial studies, because post-colonial studies theorizes a lot these uh, difference between the first world and the third world, f even though uh, really critical from the colonial terms. And uh, as Chernyevsky puts it, so first world is supposed to have a monopoly on postmodernism, third world is supposed to be connected to postcolonialism, and second world is supposed to be connected to postcommunism. Um, we, uh, I would love to question the monopoly of postmodernism uh, on postmodern on postmodern oh my god on postmodernism the first world has. Uh, to introduce, because post-colonialism is really connected to post-modernism, uh, post to introduce both of these contexts to the post-communist space. Um, and um, this, makes, uh, th this is possible because Soviet project itself was really modernist in itself, even though uh, Soviet Union was trying to theorize itself as an opposition to the West, still it was really based on the Western modernist project, and it just like, if you take modernist project out of the sort of Soviet Union, the ideology will fall, basically. Uh, so, um, it, uh, it, it, mm, it makes me to the, more or less, the end of my talk. So, uh, this is the uh, scheme that is provided by Tlastanova in her article, The South of the Poor North, that I would advise reading really, really a lot, because uh, it's basically, the best paper that is written on Russian colonial context. Um, yeah, so uh, as we assume that um, like temporalities are not that different in the West 
and in the like Russian and post-Soviet space, we can start talking about Russian coloniality. And uh, to talk about Russian co coloniality, <laughs> we need to problematize East-West, the old divide and uh, new uh, North-South divide that is present in the scheme. Uh, to theorize this divide, uh, Lasanova introduces several terms. First term, term is colonial difference, and colonial difference refers to the difference between the first class capitalist empires of modernity, the heart of Europe, and their colonies. So it's like um, proper first, like first world, third, third world division. I'm really sorry if it's not something that is really easy to grasp. Just ask me questions after. Um, and uh, then, um, as soon as she's problematizing the homo homogenization of the North that is producing by that colonial difference, she's introducing the notion of imperial difference. Uh, and imperial difference, in its own uh, sense, she's splitting into uh, distinct concepts. Uh, first is uh, internal colonial uh, uh, internal imperial difference and second is external imperial difference so internal imperial difference for example is uh, the hierarchy that is created in the west so Euro European Union as you probably know has the proper west and then some like not nice countries we don't want migrants from like Poland go fuck yourself and uh, um, then external colonial difference finally refers to Russia and uh, countries that are more or less similar in that sense. And um, this is really important because it creates the very complex situation for Russian-owned context because Russian-owned context um, means that Russia is the same time subject and objects of colonial relationships because Russia has its own secondary self. So Russia has the concept of secondary um, colonialism that is basically imported from the West. So Russia itself didn't have proper colonialism. Then they were like, oh, Western fancy people have colonialism, we want one as well. And there was the whole difference. So like basically, like French person came to Russia and it was quite a funny moment because he labeled Russia as the prison for nations. Basically, France was like, oh, you don't know how to do colonialism, right? Let me teach you. And um, okay, it's bad for Russia for obvious reasons, but it's bad for Russian colonies as well because Russian colonies, uh, find themselves in the void because okay there is a big south and they're like yeah let's unite for the struggle against decolonization but the south of Russia cannot really um, cannot really sympathize with their struggle because they're disconnected through Russia because um, so okay imagine you're like in the global south and you're still connected to the original fancy western modernity through the colonization so like really basic example you speak French so you go like to Paris, you can get like nice fancy education and be the proper like post-colonial subject that got the real nice position. But the south of Russia, like the south I'm referring to col colonies, the south of Russia is completely um, devoted from that opportunity because the Western modernity and the Western imperialism that is transferred to south is mirrored by Russia and it, um, it doesn't let the Russian colonies, for example, like Caucasus, to sympathize with the struggle and to create the decolonial momentum against Russia. And this is something that, is, that needs to be problematized in the manner that we cannot just say, oh, okay, so we have, we have post-colonial theory, let's just take Spivak, take Caucasus, <coughs> make them work together. It will not work because Spivak is not talking about the South that is uh, framed as Lassana puts it in secondary uh, Australianism. So we need to introduce something new, some, some new theory that would describe this particular local context and then let Russian South unite uh, within each other because as you can probably guess, Siberia that is colonized from Russia is, disconnect is disconnected from the Caucasus, then you have the whole hierarchy inside the Caucasus, then you have the hierarchy between Ukraine and Caucasus, and all of these problematic relationships are um, introducing the hierarchy that needs to be overcome. And also, 
um, this is really important for Russia, for itself, to realize itself as an object of colonial relations, because as you can probably guess, Russian intellectuals usually think about them as the Europeans, whereas Europeans are like, uh, what? You're, are you European? Uh, so uh, this is the framework I'm trying to introduce. And uh, for me, it's important. I'm not here going to particular examples really in depth. Because I would not love, because um, I would not love to like discriminate and like make my um, talk only about one example. At the same time, I would not love to be vague and theoretical and universalize the Russian colonial expansions uh, towards all of the colonies Russia has. So uh, we can talk more about that in terms of the conversation. And here, I'm finally stop being boring, and. Uh, I have two, like, um, so do you want to ask me questions and then we can talk about case study or should I talk about case study first and uh, questions, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, questions, yeah, done. Yeah, so basically, uh, originally, uh, like in the original version, there was short Paris video, but I would love to discuss with you something else. Because uh, short various video is like by nice intellectual jerking off, but I'm not the person that is going to do that right now. And I would love to discuss with you the case of Strelka itself, as a case that nicely represents the colonial power, and it's that <laughs> in that manner connects to the. <laughs> You're right on time. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, in that manner, it's connected to your question because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to beat me, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming that you're like highly critical about the context you're included as well. And uh, for me, the Strelka operates in two like modalities, two modes. One is connected to government and one is connected to educational institution. And educational institution connection is connected to the design. Because uh, basically the... Knowledge production of Strelka is um, really colonial in the terms of design, because if you see the way the education that is provided, how, how it works, it's completely disconnected or um, like, okay, tell me if I'm wrong. It's just something like, I have people who finished this program and also I used to live in Moscow, so I not quite a bit. Uh, I'm, Always, it's always okay to tell me that if, if I'm wrong, I'm not going to attack you. Uh, so, um, the, uh, to begin with, the manner is disconnected from the local context. Second, um, the manner it is, um, it is facing the Western audience. So the amount of PR that was produced to the Western audience was much uh, more elaborated and. Uh, uh, much more money were involved, was involved than in PR to the Russian context, and uh, the whole structure of the um, the whole structure of why this program is so appealing is based on the high Western theory being introduced to the Russian context, and um, this whole structure is not resulting in something in depth knowledgeable about the local context, which could be an issue, but it's uh, resulting in the fancy design of the, yeah, we're doing, uh, we're doing translations of the fancy theories and we have these nice people, so maybe we can combine that and create the nice Western theory in Russia. And uh, I'm really so <laughs> sorry to say, but uh, no, no, no. Mm, if you if you don't agree, I'm I'm provoking you for for the dialogue. Like um, I'm not uh, I'm not the ultimate knowledgeable person. I'm just trying to make a point that this conversation needs to happen a lot, and it's really useful to be critical towards the institutions you're in. I'm always cheating on Goldsmith every time I have a chance. I I really like. <laughs> this institution is really fucked up, <laughs> like really fucked up, and my department in particular. So I would love for you, maybe in the in the format of the conversation, to elaborate more on the stuff I was saying. Argue with me, say yeah, I was crying about that two weeks ago, earlier, or yeah, any of your thoughts in this sense. So maybe all together we can answer your question about how can we decolonize design and what can we do with that. 